Uh, welcome, everybody. This, uh, this year begins the uh, Cerno chapter's 40th anniversary of meetings. Okay. Um, 40, 40 years we've been doing this and started in 1981 by um, some forethinking current members and past members, uh, John O'Miller, Julie Morris, Belinda Perry, Wilda Meyer, you might know, uh, Jean Evoy, who's moved to Arcadia, but still involved, and uh, Russell and Marianne Owens were the um, original founding members. I think there's a few others, but those are the main ones that got together 40 years ago and decided that um, we were in an area that we could support a Native Plant Society um, chapter, which there are chapters all over the state. And um, currently, we're up to... Uh, 230 members and we seem to be growing all the time and with from what i've seen with the uh, enthusiasm of native plants and uh, the usage of native plants across the country really um i think it's only going to get stronger the native plant organization and uh, we look forward to another 40 years you know um but with that become comes uh, doesn't come free. Um, it involves all the members to stand up and, and help keep the organization strong, you know, um, and that includes uh, helping with the board, helping with volunteering with plant sales and everything. So we're always looking for new board members. Um, Eric has been president, I think, for going on five or six years now. So uh, it's time, time for a new president. Um, and there's other positions, there's always a position open. So we welcome anybody that would like to uh, get more involved. Um, but as we move forward, um, we have a great program, um, series of programs this year, and starting off with a really good one, um, uncovering the mysteries of the herbarium. And we have our own dedicated members, Liz Gandy and Bruce Holtz, sitting in front of the actual herbarium itself. Um, <laughs> I think you probably got to read the uh, bios of both Liz and Bruce, so I don't really need to um, say too much more. It's except that they're both just great people, both of them great volunteers. Um, we're so lucky to have them involved in the Native Plant Society and, and help with our mission. So um, without further ado, I'll turn the program over to uh, Liz is going to present and Bruce is going to fill in. If anybody has any chats, anything they want to uh, put in, just go ahead and uh, put them in the chat box. So. Ms. Gandy, welcome. Well, uh, thanks, Tom. I'm going to um, bump, bump her down just, just once. Um, and thanks, Karen, for the great intro, just because I want to give a little bit of perspective. So I'm sitting here uh, in our current herbarium location, which is a few blocks away from our downtown campus. We moved here just a few months ago. We're settling in. Um, and you can see the cabinets arranged behind me. Um, we have about 150 of those or so. Um, each can hold up to a thousand herbarium specimens. You're going to learn more about what a specimen is and how it's prepared. Liz has got a great overview. Um, so I've been working here for, for 26 years and really excited to see some of the major changes at Selby Gardens, um, particularly the effort to protect our living and preserve scientifically documented collections uh, that, that will be very effective for many decades to come uh, with hardened new modern facilities. Um, we were one category four or five storm away from losing nearly 50 years of uh, specimen-based research. Um, and you'll learn more about that soon. Um, we'll, we'll also be able to increase our capacity to conserve and display plants from the tropics and the subtropics, and also to in increase our Florida-based conservation work. Um, but I'm really thrilled to introduce Liz, who's been with us for six years and who we actually got to know as a volunteer in the herbarium back in the mid 1990s, fresh off the boat from Texas. <laughs> I don't know where, where you came from. Wasn't that so early? It was 2004. I moved here to oh, no, no, no. It, it, was in the, it was in the 90s, I, I'm sure. It was not. <laughs> I know you, you, you were in middle school then. <laughs> but no, Selby Gardens was my first stop though when I got here. Yeah. So, you know, after that brief stint, uh, it, you know, it's fitting now that she can take on the role as curatorial assistant for collections, especially working for the herbarium. And uh, she has extensive experience with Florida Native Plant Studies through the state park system, 
um, and more recently has helped us to conduct inventories of some of the most interesting parcels of conservation lands, including today, as, as I was mentioning uh, earlier to a few people that tuned in early, we were at the upper, uh, at the Mayaka Headwaters Preserve and with the Conservation Foundation uh, doing um, inventories of some lands that few people have ever visited. So it's, it was pretty exciting. Um, so as, as Tom said, Liz will drive the presentation and Karen uh, will monitor the chat. But uh, anyway, pipe in, pipe up. And um, thanks for joining us and take it away, Liz. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Karen and Tom, so much for that great welcome. Um, I'm now going, going let to... Me, let me cut in just really quickly, because this is a meeting, uh, just one key um, hint for everyone. If you go to view in the upper right-hand corner and click speaker, you will be have a better view of, um, of the speaker. So, okay, take it away, Liz. Thank you. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, if not, let me know now. You're good. You're okay, good. great. Thank you. All right. I know we've all been doing the Zoom stuff for a while, but sometimes I feel like I'm still kind of new to it. So please bear with me. Anyone let me know if you have any audio issues. So of course, yes, this is um, some what, how, and why of herbaria and some of the interesting stories that we can learn from herbarium specimens. So let's jump right in. But before we do that, this is, um, you know, since we're not really, you know, together in person, um, if we were together in person, one of the first things I like to ask is, um, who has ever set foot in an herbarium? So if you have set foot in an herbarium, and John, you're not allowed to answer, um, Please just uh, tell us in the chat, because um, it actually is a space that a lot of people have never been in before, so I'm always kind of curious about that. All right. So I guess the kind of the first question we need to answer is what is an herbarium? Well, um, a quick uh, sort of a, 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 a search uh, online would bring us with um, some of these definitions here, um, some Oxford, de Oxford Dictionary definitions. Of course, it is a systematically arranged collection of dry plants, right? Or the room that houses those dry, dry plants. So the same term applies. Um, and those plant, those dry plants may be housed in something other than these great cabinets that we're lucky to have here. Um, they might be housed in like little, some are housed in boxes. Um, but really, uh, in, in short, um, an herbarium is a library of preserved plants that have been dried under pressure and then they are organized in a systematic way. So herbarium collections uh, might also include algae, lichens, fungi, um, and also carpological collections, which I'll talk about um, a little more later. Um, but as you already saw um, behind Bruce, um, what the cabinets look like, um, this image here on the side <coughs> is of our cabinets. Um, they're metal, and like, he's, like Bruce mentioned, they can hold up to about a thousand specimens, depending on um, their thickness. Um, and they, the cabinets do seal. And then this other image, you can kind of see when you do open the cabinet, you kind of see that library of specimens organized. It's kind of like, think of them as kind of like books laid on end. And so here we're looking at those, the, the end of all the specimens. And this is, of course, an example of what an herbarium specimen looks like. And this is one of our local favorites, um, butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberosa. Could not resist having that one. Right, so just by way of a little bit of history, um, sometimes this is something that we don't necessarily give a lot of focus to, is how herbaria started. Um, so the Italian physician and botanist, Luca Ghini, is credited with being the first to dry plants, uh, flatten under pressure, and then preserve them adhered to paper. And this was in the early 1500s. And the reason that he did this is because he wanted his students to have access to plants during times when the plants were not available or, or live and growing, such as in the winter. And interestingly enough, the plants were adhered in a, in a more of a bound book fashion as opposed to the cabinet fashion like you see today. Um, and of course, um, as he taught this, this technique to students, it spread around the world. During the age of botanical exploration, um, drawing and preserving plants for return to collections in Europe became relatively common. It wasn't just live plants that were returned to collections, it was also preserved. Um, and Carl Linnaeus was, is credited with promoting the use and storage of specimens in the cabinet 
format that we have now. Um, and interestingly, um, he, he didn't actually pioneer this. He learned it from someone else when he was the uh, curator of the herbarium of George Clifford III, who was um, head of the East India Company at the time in the mid-1730s. So he, I think, really liked this, this cabinet arrangement because specimens could be moved around. They could be you know, rearranged taxonomically. And as we all know, Carl Linnaeus did quite a bit of taxonomy. Um, they could also be rearranged geographically. Um, and Carl Linnaeus also published his Philosophia Botanica in 1751, which is credited as being um, really the first sort of textbook of botany. And he gave instruction in there about um, collecting the proper techniques for collecting, pressing, and storage of plants. So it's probably quite interesting that while today our, um, our materials are more sophisticated, um, we have you know, special archival materials, electric dryers, air conditioned storage, but really the techniques first started by Dini really haven't changed a lot. So where are all of the herbaria? Well, we have a really wonderful online tool called Index Herbariorum. This is an online resource that's hosted by the New York Botanical Garden. And it, it um, has really important information about herbarium collections, such as who the contact, who the curators or contacts are, how many specimens they have, um, what their specialties are, what taxonomic specialists are associated with them. And this is a really tremendous resource for us as herbarium curators for correspondence and exchanging specimens. So this is a great map of where they're located all over the world. Um, and there are, of course, 3,426 herbaria worldwide. I'm not sure whether anyone knew realized there were that many. And they house an, close to 400 million herbarium specimens. And of course, those numbers grow all the time because we collect every day, right? So why herbaria? What is their purpose? So first and foremost, herbaria are repositories for plant specimens that serve as a permanent voucher that that plant occurred at a, at a place and at a given time. But every herbarium usually has a purpose for establishment. In the case of Lucagini that we just talked about, it was for as a teaching tool. For some of the largest herbaria in the world, they can often be some of, often be the oldest and they house specimens of taxa from all over the world. And sometimes they are actually the permanent repository of specimens from the time that that taxon was first collected, which is really significant. Oftentimes, smaller herbaria are focused on specific geographic areas or maybe narrow, more narrow taxonomic groups. Um, but these herbaria are really super important because they house these localized collections and they usually house really important regional expertise. So they're just as important. So a really great you know, example that I have here on the slide is a specimen of um, an orchid called uh, Dikea turkheimii. And this was collected um, from a location called Outlier Peak in Belize. And so we have a picture here of the plant in situ at the time it was collected. So it's this plant flowering in this way in this location found at this time. And of course, a map, a uh, point on the map of where it was found. And then you can see its ultimate disposition here as an herbarium specimen. So just some uh, kind of quick sort of by the numbers. Um, you can see here in the upper part of the slide some of the, the or the largest herbaria in the world. Um, the largest being Royal Botanic Gardens Q with over 8 million specimens. Um, but you can see a lot of these largest herbaria are older, right? And here at the bottom of the screen, you can see some of the smallest herbaria in the world, and most of them are more recent. And these would probably be great examples of some localized collections. Now, as far as Selby Gardens goes specifically, we fall, you know, definitely fall in the middle. Um, we, as an herbarium, were established in 1973, and we started with a donation of 3,000 specimens from Callaway Dodson, who was um, Selby Gardens' first director and a very accomplished botanist himself. So our reason for being is we have a sort of a, a mission of sorts is to utilize preserved specimen vouchers to document plant diversity and distribution and help to further understanding and appreciation of plants, especially epiphytes. And of course, we also focus on, on Florida, um, but our primary focus is the American tropics and subtropics. Um, we have a, do have a good Florida collection though, about 8,000 collection, 8, collections and growing all the time. 
Um, orchids, we have over 40,000 orchid specimens, over 14,000 bromeliads, about 10,000 gizmerians, and about 3,000 aeroids, or the family Aeraceae. So about 60% of our collection, um, of our just over 117,000 accessions, about 60% of those are from these epiphyte-rich families. So you can really see where our focus is. But I also did want to plug um, the, the, the Florida Park Service District 4 does have an herbarium that they house at Oscar Shearer State Park. That's a great example of a local herbarium that's very geographically focused. And their focus is strictly on plants that are collected within the state parks of that district, which is the Southwest uh, Peninsula. So it's a really great example locally of um, an, an herbarium that was um, established for a very specific purpose and is great you know, local knowledge. So the great question is, how do plants get here? Well, the first step in plants that want to become an herbarium specimen, the first part is field collection. Now, I cannot lie, this is definitely the fun part. This is the part where we get to all go out on our expeditions and get super dirty and have great fun in really great locations. So plants are collected under all sorts of circumstances. You know, historically, expeditions might be multi-year or multi-continental expeditions to document natural history, wherever the expedition was going. But these days, of course, we have easier travel. So um, oftentimes expeditions are only maybe a couple months or a couple weeks long if they're international. Um, but they usually require some kind of uh, off-road travel. Uh, and overnight and overnight accommodations, as you can see here in the slide. Um, locally, when we're doing work here in Florida, it's often maybe just a couple days or one day. And sometimes collections are made incidentally. If a knowledgeable person happens to see a plant that they know is important for that geographic area or is significant in some way, they might collect it right then. I mean, I've been known to jump into a ditch at my son's soccer game and grab a plant that I thought was significant and. My husband and son just kind of roll their eyes, but I know I'm not the only one that does that. Um, so it's it, and again, that just takes kind of being knowledgeable about what you're looking at. Another great way to make collections are bio blitzes, where we have lots of uh, lots of eyes looking for plants, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, and this is also really important: is that this is the point where a collection number is assigned, and you can see this one image. This is um, I won't tell you who that is holding um, a collection number and an image of the plant being collected. So the combination of that collector name and collection number will stay with those collected specimens at whatever institution they end up with. And we'll talk a little bit more about that data here shortly. So again, with the field collection, we do it any which way we can, by air, water, land, anything in between. And the field trips and expeditions are where the really great specimen stories kind of start because they're almost always some form of, of adventure, right? And there might be a really great camaraderie of collectors. Um, there might be really amazing beauty and diversity, or you might have a really crazy way in which you're collecting that plant. Like we have, you know, Bruce repelling down um, or slogging through the mud, not unusual to do either. And we have, you know, going by helicopter whatever it takes to get to the, the, the collecting area that we want to get to. Um, you also might have a harrowing death experience, like, you know, standing on a venomous snake, or in Bruce's case, getting, you know, chased by, uh, into a tree by a bunch of angry peccaries. You know, so the really, really fun thing is, those specimens that are collected at that time, when the collector sees those in perpetuity, you remember those sort of stories that went into collecting them. And that actually makes it really fun. Now, also on the, a note on collecting, a good collector will choose their collection plant very carefully and responsibly, taking only as much plant material as they need, but also enough to make a good specimen. So you always want to make sure that you're not taking more than the population can support and that you're also getting the critical parts, such as flowers or fruit um, or, or another part of the plant that you need for proper identification. So that's super important. So another really great, really important step is documentation. So for an herbarium specimen to be valid, it is really important to record proper information at the time of the collection. So that information will, re will be something, maybe something about the plant, anything that might be lost when the plant is pressed. For example, if you're collecting a tree, you're not going to collect the whole tree, you're only going to collect a branch. But if you make no indication of how big the tree was, um, or, or 
you know, how, how wide the canopy is, how tall it is, um, then that information is lost and no one else will know. Um, so it's also important to make notes about habitat, associated species, geography, any of those notes that someone not standing in the field with you wouldn't know are really important to take. GPS locations, images. This information is usually recorded in all kinds of different places. There's some examples on the slide here of some field books. You can see that some are kind of short and succinct and others are kind of like a dissertation, right? And also, um, we might use GPS units, um, digital applications, uh, cameras that use GPS. Um, so we use all kinds of tools to sort of gather that documentation together. So a really succinct journal entry might be um, this what we call skeletal data or, or really basic information at the time of being in the field. And then maybe at the end of the day or at the end of the expedition, we might then sort of backfill that with other sort of broad, uh, broad data that goes with the, the collections. And we'll talk a little bit more about that data in a minute. All right, so we have our we have our plant. We've collected it. Now, the next major step is pressing. And this step is really important because the position in which you press this plant will be the position that it lives in forever and ever. So doing this correctly is really, really important. And it's, it's ideally done as soon after collection as possible. That might be the end of the day. But as many of you know, many flowers won't last that long. So sometimes some field pressing might be necessary. But we do try to do it as quickly as possible. And oftentimes it does take some creativity. It takes some hard choices. It takes some origami. So some origami to try to um, get that specimen sort of shaped right the, just the way we want it, right? So if we're on multi-day expeditions, specimens usually will be pressed between newspaper and tied together in stacks and carried through the jungle by whoever draws the short straw. They might even be dried, um, some, have some help in drying by having some alcohol added to them. You have to remember oftentimes these are collected in really humid environments and so keeping them from molding while they dry can be a challenge. Um, field dryers can also be set up. On shorter expeditions, you know, we have the, the luxury of having um, a press with us, like what you see here, an electric dryer. So the press is this wood frame, and then, the, of course, the plant is put into the newspaper, which is really great because it allows us to make notes about the specimen on the newspaper, that collection and collector number I mentioned. And then we also have blotter paper, which helps to absorb moisture, and cardboard corrugates, which allow for air to circulate. And then, of course, then they spend some time in that dryer. It could be a few days before they're dry. It could be a few weeks. Um, sometimes we have to use specialized techniques to dry um, specialized plants, like, a, like the way we dry a fern frond and the way we dry a cactus pad would be completely different. And so we do, it does take um, some experience to try to press things properly so that the important features are visible when the plant is dry and it also dries without molding. So another really important part of making plant collections are permissions. So permissions are just a, just a standard part of the collecting process. And this usually begins many months before you ever do any collecting. And it starts with, of course, getting permission from landowners. It might be a preserve manager. It might be um, a, tri a tribal leadership. Whoever oversees that land is who would give permission. And there's also, of course, um, we, we always want to involve collaborators. If we're working in another country, we're always sure, make sure we always have collaborators within the country, other researchers that we work with, um, other institutions, and even here locally, we try to collaborate as much as we can. If we're on a field trip, it'd be great. We, let's invite the Native Plant Society to come with us. Um, and when you're shipping plants or collecting plants that are imperiled in some way, it's really important to have the proper permits in place. So it might be uh, or, or phytosanitary permits, you know, if it's live plants coming in. Um, and there are also permits that allow for um, a little bit easier transportation. So there's something, CITES has a permit called the Certificate of Scientific Exchange, and this allows institutions to register and get this permit, and so we can exchange accession materials between institutions that have this permit that are listed by CITES as endangered. And, and a great example of that would be orchids or cacti or, or tree ferns. And so that does make um, exchange of materials a little bit easier. 
All right, so we have our plant, we've got it pressed, we've got it dried. So now we want to um, identify it to the extent possible. You know, we know a lot of stuff, but of course we don't know everything. So we might be able to only identify a plant to the family level or to the genus level. But then we take all that fantastic documentation that we already made in the field, right? And we, we enter that information into a database. And then from there, we're able to generate our labels. Now, it's not unusual when we make a field collection to make more than one specimen of the same plant. And so we always want to make sure that we print enough labels for all the specimens. And we'll talk about that exchange here in a minute. And so, um, the more, so the more detailed information that we took at the time that we were in the field, the more detailed our label will be. And of course, the more useful and relevant that specimen will be for research and study. So we'll talk a little bit more about, more about label details in just a minute. But this is a really, really critical step. And it's also very, um, it, can be, it can be kind of the biggest bottleneck for us in processing specimens. Because if we don't have the information that we need for that label, then we're kind of stuck. And it takes some research to get that information. And sometimes we have specimens that have been waiting for quite a while. And we may not have you know, access to the original collector. And so we have to find old field books and things like that to put this information together. So it can be quite a bottleneck sometimes. I won't tell you how many specimens I have waiting to be labeled. So after we get our labels made, then we get to this, this other fun part. This is kind of, besides the actual collection part, besides the actual collection part, the mounting is, some of the super fun part to me. It's kind of like kind of like art class. So you see, we have this specimen here. It's in a, it's in its newspaper that it was dried in. It has its label, and it's ready to be mounted. So mounting is the process by which we adhere the specimen to archival grade paper, and that is where it's going to that will be its final resting place, where it will live from here into in perpetuity. So the herbarium sheet is an eleven and a half by sixteen and a half kind of a heavy, heavyweight paper that's, of course, archival, it's pH balanced, non-acidic. And our process here at this institution is to, when we mount the specimens, we only want a portion of the plant to actually be glued down with archival glue. The other parts of the plant, we like to tape down with archival tape so that parts of the plant can be removed for study. Our collection here at Selby Gardens is first and foremost a research collection. And so we want to make sure that uh, people can remove, uh, researchers can remove parts for further study if needed. So it's, so other institutions might have a policy of, say, gluing the entire plant down or maybe taping the entire thing. So different institutions have different ways that they do this. And then you can see here a stack of what the plants look like once they have been mounted. We pre-print our specimen sheets with accession numbers, and uh, you'll see that on the next slide. Um, and so it's very important that the mounters be able to position the plant with significant portions showing, the label, have the accession number, a barcode, and what we call a fragment packet, which holds any pieces that break off. So all of that has to be able to fit on that sheet. So you see how the original, the original pressing and drying has to take all that into account when it's being done. And so when the, so when the mounters come along, they can they have something that they can work with that doesn't require you know, you know further manipulation. You want it to be just the right shape, and that can take some practice. So uh, the mounting here at Selby Gardens is done by a group of dedicated volunteers. Um, we had a multi-year um, series of expeditions in Belize to document the epiphyte diversity of Belize. And part of our permit requirements for the country of Belize was to give them duplicate specimens that had been mounted. Many institutions want to do their own mounting, and so it's not, not super common to have that. But we had several, several trips, one in 2016 and one in 2018, whereby we took um, groups of volunteers with us to Belize to do the mounting of the specimens that stayed in the country. And it was a really great um, opportunity for us to involve our partners in the country uh, in that process. Um, we were hosted by our partner garden, Ian Anderson's Cage Branch Botanical Garden, and it was there were really great experiences for the volunteers that were able to go. And in this picture here, you can also see some of the staff from the forestry department in Belize working with us. And so that was uh, 
a really great opportunity to you know in, involve our partners in a step that it, they don't normally get to be involved with. But anyway, once this mounting is done, then that is where that specimen is going to live, adhered to that sheet, partially, in perpetuity. So after that, we do a little bit of processing. Um, if, the, if the labels were generated um, internally, then we only have to add pertinent information like the accession number, which is in that blue oval up in the upper right hand corner, that's that um, sort of unique accession number applied to that plant, and the barcode gets added. So that's pretty simple. If the specimens have come to us from other institutions, then we do have to enter that data and transcribe that label data into uh, the database kind of from scratch. And we also have a dedicated group of volunteers to do that. Um, we also have some other steps. Certain of our plant, certain of our taxonomic groups get imaged. You can see the picture here of an imaging station. And you can see, of course, in the middle, it's an example of what um, an image would look like. And so a lot this imaging has been um, really, really significantly jump-started by a series of grants um, that we have had over the years. Um, the Mellon Foundation grant in 2010 uh, funded the digitization of some of our type specimens, which, or uh, of our type specimens, which I'll talk about in a minute and allowed us to image those and publish them online. And then in 2015 and 2018, we had, uh, we were um, part of National Science Foundation grants. The 2015 grant allowed for the digitization and publication of our Florida specimens. And in 2018, uh, the grant was called Endless Forms and we partnered with um, 13 other institutions around the country with the goal of digitizing and publishing 2 million specimens. So that allowed us, that project there, allowed us to digitize our orchid collections and bromeliad, bromeliad collections. Um, but it wasn't just the digitizing, the taking of a picture of the specimens, it was also um, databasing, transcribing the data, and also georeferencing, which is a somewhat painstaking process of taking a verbal geographic locality like the corner of 41 and Osprey in the in the parking lot next to next to PF Chains, you know, in Sarasota County, Florida, USA, right? That would be a verbal locality that we can take and turn that into a latitude and longitude. The latitude and longitude is really important so that, that so that that specimen can be used in a spatial way, which we'll talk about more in a minute. But these grants allowed for the the processing of about 57,000 specimens. Um, and then, of course, our final step will be to be able to publish those online, uh, the images and the associated data to make accessible to anyone in the world at any time that wants them. And then, of course, the final step and the kind of the course that these physical specimens take is the distributing of specimens to other herbaria. And as I mentioned, we might have duplicate copies. So we might share those with other herbaria in a process we call exchange, which means I give you 10 specimens, you give me 10. Or we also might um, share them in the form of what we call a gift or a gift for determination, in which case we might send it to an institution that has a specialist uh, in, the, in, in the taxonomy of whatever the plants are, and they keep the specimens in exchange for giving, sending determinations back to us. So that goes on a lot. We do have uh, taxonomic specialists that visit us here, which is always nice. Um, but that, that exchange is really important uh, between institutions. And so um, any duplicates that we have, we always look to um, deposit them at the appropriate herbaria. And then, of course, the specimens are filed. And this is uh, not as simple of a process as you might think. Um, we do have taxonomic, a, 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 a taxonomic aspect to um, the way we file, but we also have a geographic aspect to how we file. And so again, we have, um, you're gonna get the hint that we rely on volunteers quite a bit. We have several um, the highly trained volunteers that do this um, because of course, like a library, it's very important that we be able to find those specimens again. So it's very important that they be filed correctly. So that's definitely a, another important step in the process. So we want, and we want our visiting researchers, of course, to be able to easily find those specimens. So this is just kind of a, a fun map that shows some of the institution, the locations of institutions that we exchange with. Um, the red dots are where our institutions that we do live, have done live exchange with, and then the yellow crosses are a barium exchange. You can see 
close to 200 institutions around the world that we exchange, do herbarium specimen exchange with. Um, and of course, the little blue triangle, blue green triangles are place locations that we have done uh, Soviet gardens expeditions. And there are, of course, over 200 of those around the world. So that's uh, pretty significant. Um, some of our accessory collections that we keep here, um, carpology is one of them. So carpology is, those, that's a collection of plant parts that are kind of bulky, large, or woody. If you can imagine like a long leaf pine cone, if we wanted to save that and we wanted to put that into one of our little, our little pigeonholes in the cabinet, it would take up the entire cabinet, right? So it's not efficient to keep it there. So we have the ability to, to keep, label those and then keep them in a separate location. So that's, that's carpology. And then we also have um, a collection in spirits. The spirit collections are really important because they, by, by putting plant parts into the fluids, it helps to maintain the three-dimensional structure uh, really important for plants like gazneriads or orchids that were that they're that 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 structure of the flowers uh, um, is important to preserve and so it's a it's an alcohol and glycerin solution um, and they can like specimens and can last in perpetuity as well um, and we have about 35,000 spirit collections and we actually have the second largest collection in the world second only to uh, Royal Botanic Gardens Q and of course the largest in the western hemisphere so it's a significant collection and definitely um, you know, regularly referenced as well. Um, we also have additional archives of, of, of plant illustrations, images, slides, botanical prints, um, field books. Um, so we have quite a few records and we use those to reference, um, especially for putting together uh, label information. So as I mentioned uh, just briefly earlier, um, the, one of our special collections are, the, are type specimens. So the type specimen is a specimen designated as the standard example of the name it represents. So what that means is when a plant is described, first described for science, um, the author of, of that description will designate a plant that is the reference and say, you know, I'm making this description based on this plant. And so these are really, really important taxonomic, uh, taxonomic references um that you know any any from now on you know any plant that we think might be this plant we can bring it back to this reference and make that comparison so here at selby we have about 4700 type specimens there are different kinds of types um but they are um, definitely take um, some special handling and um special um they, they they live here in my office where they're extra safe actually um <laughs> but they're um they, they, get, they get some special handling um, to, and, and of course special publication and we're always very careful in using those for exchange. And, uh, but they are a significant part of our collection and for an herbarium our size, um, we have quite a few type specimens relative to the size of our herbarium. So. Um, and then of course care and curation. Um, as you might imagine, dried plants would be quite tasty to insects, so we do have to be very careful about bringing in any pests to the herbarium. Um, specimens coming in do go through a freezing process, a freezing and a thawing and a freezing to try to kill any insects or insect eggs. We also monitor for insects. We carefully monitor and control the, um, uh, the physical conditions, uh, temperature and humidity here in the herbarium. As somebody mentioned earlier, we do have dehumidifiers running. We like our humidity humidity to be 50% or less. Um, and then, as you can imagine, it can be hard to do. Um, we want our temperature to be about 72 degrees. Um, so we definitely have to you know, work on that, especially in our temporary space. As Bruce mentioned, we do work and have the herbarium sort of in a shared space. So we have to kind of balance that temperature. Um, and of course, curation does not happen all at once. I know I kind of went through all the steps for you, but this is a great picture of what we call the dreaded working cabinet. So the working cabinet is a, a cabinet full of specimens that are somewhere in the process of being processed and curated and are waiting for something, usually labels, um, to, be, to be completed. And so we have, you know, a couple cabinets like that. Uh, specimens that are awaiting attention. They might be awaiting identification it's, or, or some other research step. Um, and so the, 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 the curation and the processing is not a straight line. Um, and it does, um, there are definitely um, plenty of specimens waiting in the wings. All right, so why do we do all this? 
So what is the use of the herbarium? Well, I can tell you there are quite a few uses. So how valuable, as I said before, how valuable the, the herbarium specimen is really does depend quite a bit on good documentation, right? That was made at the time that the collection was made. So that good documentation is going to include the plant name. Uh, here's a great example of a label. We have the family and the genus and species of, of the plant. We have where it was collected, the country, um, the district. Um, in this case, it was collected in a national park. And then we have a very specific uh, physical, physical location where the plant was collected. Um, we also have notes about the habit. You know, it's, it's an epiphyte where, where it was growing, some notes about the flowers, some notes about the habitat that it was growing with. Um, we have GPS coordinates, we have elevation, date, the collector, collector number, co-collectors. So all of this is just, so this is a really great example of a very detailed label, and we love to see this. And of course, we can take phenology then from the specimen. We can look at the specimen and we can say, hey, we see a flower. So the phenology at the time when we input the data is flowering. Um, you can see on the specimen, we have an accession number and a barcode. So all of that, all of that data is, of course, put into um, the database. But this is this is a really critical part of your bearing specimen is that, is that documentation, and this is where it gets used. They're also very important. The physical specimens themselves are very important for identification. So obviously, we've been taking lots of images, right? And those images are really fantastic references. Um, but there are some things that you may not be able to tell from an image. For example, um, telling, uh, telling these two taxa apart, we might, we, want, we might want to look at the perianth bristles. One has two to four and one has four to six. I don't care how much you zoom into these, you're not going to be able to tell that from an image. So by maintaining those physical specimens and being able to examine them, um, dissect them, even rehydrate parts of them, the first time I ever saw our orchidologist put an orchid flower into the microwave, I thought I was going to faint. But um, it's, <laughs> it is an established technique and something that um, is uh, done carefully is um, really important um, for some of these three, especially three dimensional flowers that may have been dried flat, you might be able to rehydrate and then dissect them. So believe it or not, that can be done. Um, other really great uses for the um, physical specimens are for DNA extraction. Um, this is um, a really great kind of example I have here on the slide of an article published talking um, about the phylogenetic relationships of Hectia, which is a bromeliad genus. And to, to create or to, um, to build this phylogenetic tree, we call it, they, were, they used um, material from herbarium specimens and this is at the bottom this just a brief excerpt from the publication listing the the different herbaria that they um, use specimens from for dna analysis and you can see how many herbaria are there um, these little acronyms um, each stand each, each stand for a different herbarium our herbarium acronym is cell and you can see we're on there as well so that was kind of a, it was a, a great number of, of herbaria that they used um, specimens from in order to build this, this genetic phylo, phylogenetic tree. Um, the physical specimens can also be used for chemical analysis. Um, you can measure uh, heavy metals such as lead and mercury. Um, radioactive isotope levels can even be detected. Um, so atmospheric, you know, atmospheric changes can be, can be detected as well. Um, a nutrient analysis might be able to tell to show you changes in carbon dioxide levels since the higher carbon dioxide levels might lead to greater sequestration of nutrients in the soil and therefore be less available to plants. Um, so you know you can use the physical specimens for all sorts of things in this way and it's really great because this chemical analysis might be able to be you know correlated with maybe specific events over time you might be able to say hey this industrialization incident happened here Let's look at the, the chemical analysis of plants collected before that date, around that date, and years after, and see those changes over time. So a, another really great use of herbarium specimens is as a teaching tool, right? We talked about leukogeny at the beginning. Um, they're a really, really perfect resource for teaching plant taxonomy. And of course, here at Selby Gardens, a lot of our curation and our um, specimen collection 
and preserve work goes on behind the scenes. And so we really um, appreciate being able to share our specimens during the annual orchid show, which our orchid show is coming up, um, opening on October 9th. And you can see in these images, um, the, you know, the process of selecting specimens. In one case, it's selecting spirit specimens to use for the show. And another is looking at the digital images of the Orchidaceae orchid collection, um, which is really fantastic because if we're using them for display, we might have a specific set of, set of criteria we're looking for for the specimens. And that way we can look at them easily without having to handle the specimens. So it really makes it really great um, to be able to yeah, look at them and um, not have to overhandle. And we only pull the ones that we need. So please come in and check out our um, 2021 orchid show, aerialists from the treetop to the big top. So the herbarium, so that was a little bit about the, the physical specimens themselves. So that data, that documentation that we took, remember, that got it has been put into a database, which can then be digitally published. There are all sorts of uses for that data as well. Um, there, you can map them out and look at, you know, the, the occurrence and the distribution of plants. We can look at imperiled species. We might be able to see that, hey, this plant, this particular taxon was collected quite a bit during this time frame, but it hasn't been collected in 10 years. What's going on here? We can also see invasive species showing up in the herbarium record, and we can sort of track um, their occurrence over time when they first showed up. We can do modeling, um, climate modeling, or a probability of, 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 of where, um, where we think a taxon might occur. Um, and on this example on the slide, we have heat maps of the current um, distribution of golden leather fern and giant leather fern here in Florida. We might be able to combine to combine these heat maps and look at where these two species overlap. We can also then maybe uh, predict what we think will happen with the species distribution of these plants um, as say sea levels rise. Where do we think they will go based on the climate needs of each of these of each of these species? Uh, we can also look at phenology, which is of course flowering and fruiting cycles. Um, you know how have those changed over time? Are they changing over time? Um, and, and temporal changes, of course, changes, changes through time. Um, a really, really important pre-deforestation records, you know, we're, we're, we lose land so quickly. And, and where, where is that record of what was once there? Well, here's where it is. So another really super fun use, I think, of, um, of herbarium data is stocking collectors. So <laughs> this is um, just kind of one example of of data that has been published online that is freely available and in the span of about 15 minutes i was able to go to an online data aggregator which i'll talk more about in just a second and pull this data these these collections of, from john kunkel small and put them onto a map and and be able to show where those collections were made spatially so if the data is curated and and correctly and um and published, then it's readily available to do things just like this. Um, so, of course, you know, John Kunkel Small was a very significant um, collector, the first curator of museums at New York Botanical Garden, and documented a lot of the flora of Southeast US, um, especially for Florida, with over 60,000 specimens. Obviously, I don't have 60,000 points here, but John Kunkel Small's collections are a great example of collections that require that geo referencing process that I talked about earlier, where the locality has to be you know, taken and turned into latitude and longitude. And that can be a really slow process because um, it is it is quite it does take um, some some sleuthing sometimes to do. So um, any collections that are probably over you know, 15 years, 15 years old or so aren't going to have GPS coordinates. So that has to be done. And then another great example, and I put this one on for Fran Palmieri, who I don't think is here tonight, but um, I know this is one of her one of her favorite collectors. Um, Olga Lekela, who, um, of course, she was um, curator of the USF herbarium from 1960 to 1973. And I love this collecting map um, of her collections because you can see um, in the north, you can see her time when she was um, curator of the herbarium at the University of Minnesota. And then you can see when she was at the University of, University of South Florida, which I thought was really interesting. By mapping out her collections, you can see where she you know, spent her time collecting and based on you know, where she was housed. So the importance of, of staying relevant um, as a collection, 
um, if an herbarium collection is not used, it, it begins to lose relevance. So it's really our goal that our specimens and the associated data be used and referenced as much as possible. Uh, visiting researchers, um, exchanging with other institutions, um, and having our specimens published online with digital and online access make all that possible. Um, and of course, visiting researchers that come to Selby Gardens also have access to our living collections, um, which um, hopefully have, or many of them have um, associated data with them, just like our herbarium specimens do. And so that really helps to make their research time here even more productive. And so this was the summer we were lucky, really lucky to host some of our Gisneria researchers, John Clark, who's here on the call, yay, um, and Laura Calavijo and Jeremy Keene and some uh, of their, their students uh, were here and uh, for a month. And so it was really great to host them and um, have them be able to use our specimens to do uh, their genetic work. So, and of course, the exchange, this is, a, this is an image of um, specimens waiting to be exchanged with other institutions. Um, you know, shipping, especially of, of, of specimens that require special permits, that can be you know, slow to happen. Um, so we definitely have those in working cabinets as well. So, but um, some of these will go out, you know, for, for trade or for um, identification. So um, when scientific publications reference herbarium specimens, um, the specimens and, and the herbarium where they're deposited are cited in those publications. And John, I, I borrowed one of yours, or no, yes, borrowed one of yours. Um, so this is a, a great example of a new Gisneriad species from Costa Rica that was described and published. Um, and you can see here in an, in an excerpt, you know, how the, the, pub, how the uh, collection was cited, the collector and collector number, and also the holotype that is deposited at cell. So it's indicating where that type specimen is. Um, and this was um, a new species of um, Drymon Drymonia, and it was called Drymonia decora. Um, so I'm, I'm hopefully I'll get this all straight, John. <laughs> um, that the epithet, the species epithet is Latin for graceful, and it refers to the species characteristic sort of hanging or pendulous habit. So it's not, uh, which is not commonly seen in the Drymonia genus. So, and the name also pays, um, pays homage to um, uh, Ann Patton, who was um, the co-manager of the preserve, the Boracayan preserve, where the plant was collected, and her grandmother, Anna Esworthy, who was, uh, been a long, was, was a long time um, friend of the gardens and volunteer. Um, so, you know, there's a, very much a story behind, you know, how the plant was named, um, and, you know, it, um, you know, that involves everything from, you know, where the plant was collected as well as, you know, you know, friends of friends of the gardens and friends of collections. So, which I think is really interesting. So this is a plant that we have a living collection of here at Selby as well. So where do herbaria go from here? Well, the digital age <laughs> will lead us to uses that we can't ever even imagine. Um, the sources of herbarium data and natural history collection data in general are getting easier and easier to access. With these projects of digitizing specimens and um, the images and the data and being able to publish them online to um, what we call online aggregators, which are sites that take the natural history collection data from all sorts of institutions and aggregate them together. The data is free, it's accessible to anyone that wants to use it. So I have a couple of examples here. CERNEC, the Southeast Regional Network of Expertise and Collections. Um, our, our collections that have been um, published online, our Florida collections um, are published here. And then from there, then they're pulled to even larger aggregators. Um, and then um, uh, GBIF here also, um, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, also a great data source, um, free and open. It's also an aggregator. But, you know, while the data and the images being online is really important and, and accessible to anyone wanting to use it, there, I can't imagine a point where the physical specimens uh, will not be just as important. So, but we do have a responsibility to make sure our collections are freely and equitably available. And we also have a responsibility to proper, properly care for the physical specimens in perpetuity. So it's really important um, that we house them correctly. So to do that, um, we have, of course, we have a master plan <laughs> at our downtown campus. 
And this is a especially important um, uh, as far as our department is concerned for collection security and um, resilience um, to climate change. And this is just kind of a, um, an example of the second floor of the research building where our research collections will be housed. And the upcoming um, sort of phase one of our, of our Selby Gardens master plan. So ground has already broken, you probably heard, um, on the first phase, and which will involve um, a new welcome center, the plant research center, and the leaf structure, which will house, the leaf structure will house the um, uh, solar array on the roof, um, the restaurant, um, the parking. So that, so that will, all, all three of those sort of major structures will be part of the first phase. And um, so the second floor plant research center will house the herbarium, and of course, the, um, with room to grow or to, to about 200,000 specimens. It will house the spirit collections, the molecular lab, the flasking lab, and the library. And so again, second floor, so that um, we're really excited about that. So we will be able to you know, protect our, our collections from um, you know, uh, potential storm impacts, of course, and climate change impacts. And um, the plan will be using, of course, sustainable building technology um, with um, uh, stormwater purification and solar and solar energy plant on site. Um, so making us the first uh, ever net positive botanical garden complex in the world. So we're kind of excited about that um, level of, level of su sustainability. So and we'll, of course, have more space for plants and people. And of course, you know, collection security is a big one. So what can you do? Um, well, one of the really important things that you can do is to support the preservation of natural history collections. Um, and that's not just herbaria, but any natural history collections, whether it's fossils or insects or birds, um, all, all natural history collections are exactly where we are, working to try to digitize their collections, um, put them in the hands of potential researchers, and to, to, and to stay relevant. Um, also, please use collections. Um, if you have work that you do that involves um, accessing some of these online aggregators, think about how often you do. You, you might use the USF Plant Atlas online. Uh, I mean, it's it's really important that they that those collections be cited because that helps us to be able to maybe write grants to be able to say, hey, this is how often our collections get used and get accessed. But that doesn't happen if the collections aren't, cite, aren't cited in research work properly. So please definitely do that. Um, and of course, do use them. Um, and you, know, you can contribute by making collections yourself, making them, you know, of course, responsibly and properly. And you can also, um, you, can, you can make observations. Um, of course, we have a, a, um, a project involving observations called the Manatee, Sarasota Manatee Ecoflora Project, which is, I have highlighted right here. And this is, of course, using the iNaturalist platform where people can make observations of plants. You take a picture and it records where you are. And that is a really great supplement to the herbarium record. And we use the data collected during the Sarasota Manatee Ecoflora project to help us to make new county record vouchers um, because we can see observations that have been made that have not been vouchered with herbarium specimens. And so it's a really great tool, but it's a really great supplement to um, to that herbarium record. But you can also use other other um, online references like eBird, you know, you know whatever whatever um, natural history observations you make regularly. You know, please definitely make those contributions. Um, financial assistance assistance never hurts. Um, a lot of institutions, you know, are, especially big institutions, um, natural history collections are are um, you know competing for dollars. So it's really, uh, really important to uh, use those collections and support them. So some resources. Um, these are just, uh, again, some of, some of the websites of some of the online um, portals where, where natural history data gets aggregated. Um, so if you're interested in other types of natural history collections, um, this iDig Bio is a really great one. And they also have a lot of online resources um, and so I would encourage you to check out their website and see what kind of resources that they have available. Um, of course, the Plant Atlas. Um, and also um, this book um, called Herbarium, written by Barbara Tears, who was um, just uh, recently retired curator of the New York Botanical Gardens. It's a beautiful book, very informative about the history of herbaria and through time. Uh, very beautifully done. And then, of course, another couple other uh, herbarium handbook type books. 
uh, about um, just preserving specimens and making specimens and collecting. So, all right. So with that, I'm going to leave it with um, open for questions. And I also wanted to just kind of highlight some Saturday tour information, which I know, Karen, um, you might be going into that. Yes, if you will send that to me, I'll send it to the participants. And we okay. are now full for the okay. Saturday field trips. We have 10 people at, coming at 9 and 10 people coming at 10.15. So um, okay. pretty excited. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, I'll be happy to open it up for questions. If anybody would like to um, you know, ask a question in person <laughs> or via chat, please do. And we'll do our best to answer. We did have a few chat questions. Okay, um, hit us. So we'll start with the first one that came in from Jay Mack. In the specimen, what is it covered by? It looks like a plastic sleeve that is put in that covers the top. Um, we do not standardly cover them with anything. Um, I'm not sure if maybe the image kind of looked that way. We do have plastic sleeves that fit um, prop, that, that fit over an herbarium sheet, but we usually reserve those for um, specimens that might be, say, allergenic, like I say, a poison ivy specimen, um, or maybe um, there were there was a period where sometimes specimens would be treated would be treated with um, a mercury type solution to try to keep um, try to preserve them, and so if they've been treated with a chemical, sometimes they can be bagged. Or if they're, say, an inflorescence that is just exploding with seeds and we want to try to contain them, we might put them in plastic. But otherwise, we don't standardly. We store them, you know, in, in folders um, arranged, in, so, arranged taxonomically. All right. Judy Kinberg says, you mentioned some ways of analyzing specimens, including DNA extraction and dissection. Doesn't that destroy the specimen or at least seriously compromise its integrity? That's a great question. Um, it does that kind of sampling. We have a term for that. It's called destructive sampling. And it's always done with the permission of the curator of the herbarium. So let me just be clear about that. Do not walk through an herbarium and start breaking off pieces that's frowned upon. Um, so any, anything, any type of research like that is done with permission. And but usually um, very, very small amounts of the plant are usually required. Um, and you know, DNA cannot be extracted from every type of specimen. Um, but it's not usually enough to compromise the specimen itself. Um, and if dissection is done, um, usually any of those parts can be saved in that fragment packet that I pointed out, which is on every specimen. So the purpose of that is so that if anything does break off or pieces are removed for dissection purposes, you know, then they can be put in that packet. Um, you know, if there is to say like a single feature, like it's maybe a single flower and dissection or rehydration is required, then that's a conversation to have with the curator um, of the collection to decide if that's okay or not. All right. Um, Linda Gowen asks, if a plant has seeds, do you keep them in a separate file or do you try to preserve them for future growth? <laughs> well, that depends. Um, you know, we, of course, you know, here at Selby Gardens, we, since we do maintain a living collection, it's not necessarily unusual for us to make a live plant collection or a seed collection at the time that we make a, a collection destined for the herbarium. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're asking about, you know, so we might, we might, yes, maybe collect all of the above. Um, but we also might be able to, you know, collect seeds off of an herbarium specimen and, and germinate them. Of course, it all depends on the seed. Um, they're not typically going to last forever, right? Um, you know, uh, Bruce, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, to yeah. I, I think um, just want to mention that currently we do not have a seed bank per se. So we do not routinely collect seed and preserve them, um, although we have done, and this is one of Liz's projects, is to collect and store Tillandsia utriculata seed in different uh, environments to see about how they germinate and how long the seeds last in different, you know, uh, methods, uh, room temperature, freezer, refrigerator. Uh, but uh, no, we would love someday, our goal is to get a, a real seed bank and, and to work with the other uh, seed banks in, in the country and in the world to preserve seed for future germination. 
Yeah, that does take special facilities, so. Okay, um, Jay Mack says, when I've submitted plants to be vouchered to the plant atlas, it is sent through the University of Florida IFAS. Do you submit to the atlas? I know you mentioned it, but I didn't understand if you submit for vouchering or for the county. Um, let me see here. So we, um, you know, the, the USF plant atlas has, um, they, they do try to pull in, you know, data of, of, of collections that are not necessarily housed at University of South Florida, right? And I think that maybe that's what you're referring to. Um, so if you have a, a specimen deposited at University of Florida and say USF does not have a du duplicate of that, then they can get that data and they can, you know, acknowledge that specimen. So, you know, here, um, it's not unusual for us to share duplicate specimens of our Florida collections with USF, UF, Florida State, you know, whatever the appropriate herbarium might be. Um, we have had instances where we have only a single specimen of something, um, we call that a unicate. And in those cases, sometimes um, we will just let USF know that we have it. Um, you know, I think we have enough, you know, herbarium cred that they trust us. So, so they'll usually um, take our, you know, take our list like that. Um, so we've done that in the past. Um, as we publish more online, though, and, and image and publish our data and our specimens online, then they can access that and hopefully be able to pull that in. So um, that's kind of a long way of saying that it kind of get, gets done in both ways, you know, the physical specimen being shared or the data being shared um, for them to get that information. But right. I will. Oh, sorry, I will also okay. note. Oh, sorry, I will also note that USF Plant Atlas is a tremendous resource. But please do look at other other data aggregators online. Um, and I have found um, some additional collections that way. So if you're looking for, you know, has this has a specimen been vouchered and where, you know, I do would encourage you to, you know, sort of, you know, broaden your search um, when looking for those. Good. So in relation to that, um, Kathleen asks, um, you mentioned USAF, which I, I it, you, you are saying USF, which is the University of South Florida Plant Atlas. She asks, how are you affiliated? Are you at um, all? No, we're not affiliated. Um, they're just another, you know, institution with whom we exchange materials and, and data um, and in correspondence and, you know, um, you know, sharing identifications and yeah, so, but we're not officially affiliated, no. Right. Yeah, I, I would just add, Liz, that uh, um, we have had the most tremendous exchange with USF Herbarium uh, since since I started working at Selby Gardens. And I know looking at the records since the probably 70s with uh, uh, Richard Wonderland and Bruce Hansen, they've sent us many, many duplicates and we've exchanged also with them. So it, it, they're great regional partners. Yeah, and they're a great resource for um, I, you know, I, identifications as well. Um, you know, that's a really great thing also about having data online is sometimes you, know, we can, you can find an identification of the specimen you have in your hand. If a duplicate has been sent to other institutions, you can find that information easily. So they're a great resource for that. So Liz, my favorite herbarium specimen at Selby? Oh, don't ask me that. <laughs> we, you know, um, for, for those of you who are able to come on Saturday, I'm, we'll have some of our favorites out. Um, you know, I, and, and one of them is a super interesting one, which is a, a, a specimen of, um, you know, Bonamia grandiflora, which is, you know, of course, a scrub Bonamia that was um, collected in Sarasota County. Um, and of course, it no longer occurs in Sarasota County, but it's a really beautiful specimen. Um, and so I find that one it'd be particularly special and also, you know, poignant of some of the things that we just talked about tonight about how, you know, specimens can provide a record of something that's, you know, no longer there for, you know, whatever the reason might be. Um, so they're really an important part of that, you know, that distribution history. Yeah. And, and, you know, oh, sorry, uh, Tom. Um, I was just going to say that we, we could potentially do another tour, not that day, but, you know, down the road, we can look to opening up the herbarium for visitation by our group. Yeah, definitely reach out. Yep. Well, I wanted to point out, I think that um, 
Sean Patton mentioned that there's a couple of bio blitzes coming up. I'm not sure the particular dates, but you might, if you know the dates, and I think, I guess they're part of the Sarasota Manatee Ecoflora project. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Sean, are you there? Can you um, open yeah. up your... Tell us. Howdy, everybody. Um, once again, a great talk on the herbarium. I've been in there many times and I've contributed many water plants <laughs> that are very fun for Liz to press. And they, these are drying, these are drying quite well and free of mold, by the way. Yay. Um, so we have two bioblitzes this week. One we're teaming up with Manatee County for, and one is just a Selby bioblitz. The Selby bioblitz is going to be on the 24th, so this Friday, 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. at Deer Creek South Entrance. Deer and Prairie the other, Creek. Yeah. Deer Prairie Creek South Entrance. And the other one is going to be um, with Manatee County. It's um, We're going to be partnering with them for that. And I believe that one is Rye Preserve. And that's going to be 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And I'll go ahead and repost the link to sign up for those in the com in the chat. Both are free. All you need to do is either have a camera or um, a cell phone with iNaturalist download, and then you can participate. We're also doing our two-month-long EcoQuest asters all around. Where we're asking people to look for asters, and it's a surprisingly diverse family, only really rivaled by the Orchidaceae family. And if you want to see tons of those, there's plenty of both in the herbarium. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and link those in the chat. And we actually have quite a few people competing for the top spot for asters since there's so many both species and observations you can do from the common Bidens to the beautiful blazing stars to the giant sunflowers and groundsel trees. There's a lot of diversity in the group. And if you have any questions, feel free to just email us at ecoflora at Selby or um, feel free to reach out to one of us. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. That's yes, please join us. We definitely welcome all those eyes. And we got one more question in from Kathleen Konachek Moran. She says, How do you fit something big like a palm leaf in your herbarium? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> so there's no rule that says that a particular specimen has to fit on only a single sheet. So we do, we definitely have what we call multi-sheet collections where a specimen will be divided over however many sheets are necessary to fit all of the plant parts that we want to. And so um, oftentimes a palm might be one of those, um, but sometimes we are required to, you know, trim down parts of the plant. So I wouldn't put an entire frond, I might trim you know, the whole half of it off, but you can still see the other half, you know, so you have to do make, you have to make some educated compromises sometimes. Um, but uh, yes, multi-sheet collections are definitely a thing and we do that quite a lot. No question. Yeah. And Jeff Reber, Reber Jeff says, just, um, he says, Mayaka River State Park has a great herbarium collection specific to the park. Mm, yes, and he, also asks you to describe how you press a cactus pad or other fleshy plant. Oh, cactus. Um, we find the nearest intern. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we, we, do, we do it very carefully. Um, usually um, a, a, a cactus requires um, some um, cutting into the epidermis and that allows us to sort of open up the, uh, the epidermis or the skin, of course, um, allows us to kind of open that up a little bit and let that air sort of circulate internally um, to the pad or the stem or whatever it is. Um, and so we also, it also requires some close monitoring. Um, you know, I might put it in a dryer for a day or two um, and then check it, change the, change the blotter paper and change the, the cardboard corrugates because they're usually going to be wet. And so it usually takes a lot of that changing out um, to make sure that uh, no mold occurs, you know, keeping an eye on it. But usually, um, you know, and there, there are other other sort of techniques where you might um, um, maybe dry it with some alcohol. I've never had great luck with that. Um, but you also also maybe help kill some of the bacteria that might lead to mold. Um, but or, but the flowers of night blooming cacti are some of the worst molders on the planet in my experience. So <laughs> we we uh, we definitely have to uh, um, take very special care with those. So, but they're they're a little bit of a challenge. And where I, where uh, my colleague Sean McCourt would like to start start uh, experimenting a little with, bit with um, some silica, like um, silica um, pebbles, to maybe see if uh, we can get some drying done that way as well. 
um, maybe at least a little bit of initial drawing before the whole thing gets flattened. So stay tuned. We'll always always experimenting. All right. So the BioBlitz link is now um, towards the bottom. If anybody wants to go to the chat, you can copy and paste or just click on that on your computer or phone or uh, iPad. Um, and that's about it on the questions. I was going to ask Bruce, but I don't see he disappeared. Are you there? No, you're here, Bruce. Where'd you go? <laughs> He's back. I want to know about the peccaries. <laughs> <laughs> I have a video of the peccaries. It's um, we were pretty far into the woods um, in Belize, and um, we saw a cute little peccary in the woods, and we were kind of looking at it around a palm tree. And next thing we knew, one hundred peccaries were charging us, <laughs> and they're not very they're not very friendly actually. Uh, they're cute. The young ones are cute, but so we we ran uh, for our lives. Um, several um, of my close colleagues were with me and we were able to get up into a, into, into a tree branches and um, you actually had to climb up. We did. <laughs> and, and we were ready. I had my machete out. We were ready to, you know, defend our lives. And, but, but I, but I okay. was all, also able to get up my camera in time to get a good video. <laughs> <laughs> That was more important than you know anything else. Getting the getting the photograph. So, well, video. great. That's yeah. it. Please bring it on Saturday for the. the oh, oh, okay. <laughs> it's probably online somewhere on on YouTube or something. I don't know. All right. Well, okay. So. Go ahead. Great, great meeting tonight. So, uh, thanks. Elizabeth and Bruce for sharing your knowledge with us and Karen thank you for being the, our nice zoom moderator and getting us through all the uh, quirks here and uh, and thank everybody for joining in and uh, celebrating our uh, 40th year anniversary of Saranoa chapter FNPS. Yes. Awesome and I want to also put a plug in for next month. Um, so our speaker next month on October 18th is Jenny Steibel. And she's gonna. Um, she's an author and an award-winning author and a great landscaper. And she's gonna talk about climate-wise landscaping. And um, then our field trip the following Saturday, October twenty-third, will be Pam Callender, our own Saranoa member. She's an eco artist and has created the Lifelines Project, which is connecting urban gardens via. Um, easements and um, other ways to connect garden to garden for pollinators right in Sarasota County. So if you come on that field trip, you can learn how you can be part of the climate solution. 